welcome to Sigurd's uh, seminar. This seminar is a timely seminar because it is discussing a, a timely manner. Uh, we have, I would like to welcome all of you. I would like also to welcome our, our guests, uh, Dr. Yasin Akhtar. And also on Skype we have with us Dr. Hamid Musawi. And also will be speaking to us uh, Dr. Samia Arya. Um, we'll start with Dr. Hamid Musawi first. He'll give a speech and then we'll take 15 minutes question and answer. Uh, Dr. Musawi will then leave us and we will continue with Dr. Uh, Yasin and Dr. Sami. Uh, to the rest of the seminar. Uh, Dr. Hamid Musawi is from the University of Tehran. He is the assistant professor at the Faculty of Law and Political Science. Uh, with, with Dr. Hamid, we, we hope that Dr. Hamid uh, speaks to us about Iran's position. Iran's position on the assassination uh, <coughs> So, can you hear me? Yes, should I start? Yeah, just, just one second. So, inshallah, we will start with Dr. Ha uh, Hamid, as I said. He'll speak to us about Iran's position in particular. Of course, we can go beyond that, but maybe focus. Uh, we'll be followed by Dr. Yassin. He'll, pre he'll precisely speak to us about Turkey's position and then the, the regional picture, precisely, of course, beyond and further as well. Uh, we'll conclude with Dr. Sami that inshallah will speak to us about more of a, a global perspective. Uh, Dr. Hamid, inshallah, let's do about 20 minutes. We'll listen to Dr. Hamid and then we'll have about 15 minutes question and answer. Floor is yours. Uh, Salamun alaikum, everyone. I hope you're welcome. So I'll, I'll try to uh, my uh, uh, talk to the 20 minute limit. Uh, if we want to look at this from a uh, strategic viewpoint and from the viewpoint of the relationship between Iran and the U.S., I'll give you a very, very short introduction of how all of this is being viewed in Tehran. So as you all know, Iran was a close ally of the Americans during the period of the Shah. But when the Iranian revolution happened because of its very anti-imperialist uh, points, Iran ideologically became very hostile to the Americans and the relationship between the two countries deteriorated significantly. Now in the past 40 years there have been several instances uh, of trying to improve the relationship between the two countries. I would say the most significant was when Mohammad Khatami became the president of Iran in 1997 and he essentially started a foreign policy called the Dialogue of Civilization and he really tried to improve the relationship with the United States even, you know, uh, both rhetorically as well as even in terms of cooperation on the ground uh, to the point that actually the relationship between the two countries really very much improved and even Iran assisted the Americans in the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan. The Taliban was seen as an enemy of both countries. The relationship was going very well. But after the events of 9-11, even though Iran was really not involved at all in the terrorist attacks, um, the United States suddenly put Iran as part of the axis of evil, and there was even serious plans in the United States to attack Iran. Um, Iran was essentially seeing itself as being next after Iraq. So after Iraq would be over, we would be essentially the next target. And Qasem Soleimani, this is where he actually really came into the picture. He had been the head of the Quds Force for a few years by then. But um, essentially he was a very influential in trying to quote-unquote defeat the Americans in Iraq, helping various militias in Iraq, and this is why the Americans are essentially saying that he is responsible for the death of a few hundred soldiers. This goes back to, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007. And uh, essentially that experience of, you know, Khatami being 
nice to the Americans, trying to improve the relationship with, and the, the conclusion of that was that Iran became the axis of evil, was that in Tehran a lot of people felt that the Americans essentially only understood the language of power. And it was very difficult to actually reach a, an agreement with the Americans to lower the hostilities between the two countries. Let's fast forward. Uh, when President Rouhani came into power, essentially the Iranian economy was under a lot of pressure. And his goal and his promise during the elections was, if I'm elected, I'm going to negotiate and reach a deal with the Americans and I'm going to improve the economic situation. And that the result of that was the Iranian nuclear deal. Now, the nuclear deal put very, very serious limitations on, on Iran's nuclear program, and in return, the Americans um, suspended a lot of their sanctions. Now, when Donald Trump came into power in 2017, and he started slowly at first, but then it accelerated very quickly, the so-called maximum pressure campaign, um, there were two kinds of analysis in Tehran, especially both in academic circles, but as well in government circles. The first camp was saying that Trump, this whole idea of the so-called maximum pressure campaign, which we also saw the latest stage of which was the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the idea and the goal of that campaign is to pressure Iran to reach a so-called better deal. When I say better, it means better for the Americans. So the Americans essentially would pressure Iran and the result of that would be that they would get more concessions from Iran, both on the nuclear front as well as on the regional front, okay? Uh, and the, the, when, when, if you accept this position, then it all becomes a cost-benefit analysis. So, so a group of the people in this camp had the idea that we should negotiate with the Americans, you know, give some more point, you know, concessions and reach a new deal. And there was also a second camp. The second camp was saying in Iran that the goal of the Trump administration is really not to reach a better deal, but rather the goal is for regime change, okay? So yes, they are saying that we do want to deal, we do want negotiation, but the ultimate end is, you know, they want to pressure Iran and they want to uh, overthrow the government here. And if you subscribe to this position, then essentially negotiations and reaching a deal become meaningless. Because if you see the person at the other side of the table working to completely overthrow you, then you know reaching a deal would essentially it might even be a trick for to pressure Iran even further. Now these two camps existed in Iran, and for example, at the University of Tehran, we we always have discussions of whether. We should negotiate and talk to the Americans. And I do have colleagues that were actually advocating the vote that we should negotiate with the Trump administration before the election, before the election in November 2020, because Donald Trump needs us. He wants to really tell the American public that I reached a deal with the Iranians, and this would be a good time to reach a deal. Now, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani uh, last week really changed that dynamic. I would say it's it's a very significant game changer in Iran-U.S. relations. It's akin to when the United States put Iran as part of the axis of evil in January 2002. Why do I say that? Because with the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the two camps that I talked to you about no longer exist. So, so even the analysts that were talking about negotiations and reaching a deal with the Americans, right now are saying the Americans want regime change. Its negotiations are out of the picture. Uh, you have to understand Qasem Soleimani's position in the Iranian system. Officially, Qasem Soleimani was the head of the Quds Force, so officially speaking, he wasn't even Iran's top general because the IRGC actually has a general itself, General Salami, and then we even have a general which is the essentially Iran's version of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Saeed Arbaveri, who is in charge of IRGC as well as the Army, as well as the Air Force, etc. But in reality, in reality, so that, that's the official chart, but in reality, Hassan Soleimani was essentially the most powerful military figure in all of Iran, okay? 
okay? He was the head of the Quds Force for over 20 years. He was also very popular among the Iranian masses uh, for different reasons. And this is, again, unlike other generals in the Iranian system. Uh, he was seen as a champion of the Iran-Iraq war, a national hero. But he was also seen as someone who protected Iran both against the Americans during the Bush administration as well as against ISIS. And one of the things that the killing of Qasem Soleimani actually did was that it actually even mobilized the public in favor of the government. And this happened actually just a few weeks after we had the protests for the increase of the fuel prices. But let's go back to Iran-US relations. The killing of Qasem Soleimani, I would say, is a turning point because at least for a whole decade, it will mean in Iranian, among Iranian analysts and among Iranian decision makers, it will lead them to a path where the Iranians are essentially feeling that they are under attack and they are surrounded by the Americans. Again, if you go back to 2002, 2003, it's essentially the same feeling, that the Americans are really trying to encircle us militarily, they're trying to take out Iran's top generals, they are trying to sanction Iran, not because they want to deal, but they are trying to sanction us because they really want to weaken us. And the result of that is that the tensions between Iran and the United States will increase dramatically. Now, this round of you know back and forth military exchange between Iran and the United States is over for now, at least. So, so they essentially assassinated Qasem Soleimani in Iran attack Enor Assad in, in Iraq. And for now, the military round is over. Nevertheless, the fundamentals of the hostility between Iran and the United States, not only do they exist, but they have severely been amplified by the events of the past week. The result of that is, I think, first of all, I do not think we will have any form of negotiation or any form of deal between the two countries at least for a few years. So, so the camp that was talking about negotiation and reaching a deal, nobody right now in Tehran is talking about that anymore. Um, at the same time, hostilities and instability between the two sides is bound to increase. So, so in the coming months and years, um, I really do think that the Iranian side and the Iranian Supreme Leader is very serious when he's saying that uh, we are going to drive out the Americans from the region. Um, I don't think that is just something that it, they are saying rhetorically. Um, and uh, the result of that essentially will be more hostilities and more tensions between Iran and the United States. Uh, it's very difficult to tell what the motivation of the Trump administration was in assassinating Qasem Soleimani. Um, when I say it's difficult to tell their motivation is that Essentially, from a military standpoint, the killing of Qasem Soleimani does not really diminish Iran's military capacity that much because, I mean, he was just one person. Yes, he was very popular, but he, taking him out doesn't mean that Iran does not have the military capacity it did before. And at the same time, like I said, if, if you buy the Trump administration's rhetoric that they do want to deal with Iran, they do want negotiation, and you saw that actually um, yesterday when Donald Trump spoke as well, he said he even talked about cooperation fighting ISIS. This essentially does not help in that regard at all. Like killing Qasem Soleimani essentially is going to kill that path. It already has. And I think we are going to see a major struggle between Iran and the United States in the months and years to come. Um, in terms of regional issues, I think it, it, the, the, the killing of Qasem Soleimani is, I think, is going to also increase tensions between Iran and regional rivals such as Saudi Arabia and UAE, because as, as, and especially Israel. Um, uh, just, just to open a parenthesis, one of the things that Iran sent a message to the Americans was that if you retaliate to the attacks we conducted on Ain al-Assad, then we are going to hit Israel. So Israel is really being seen into the picture, even though they have been relatively quiet during the past few days. So um, just to conclude, I think I'm out of time to conclude.
essentially, I think the event is a very serious game changer. It really heightened it, the tensions between Iran and the United States. Qasem Soleimani, um, some people have called him the number two of Iran, but even if we don't consider him number two, he was perhaps in the top four most powerful figures in Iran. And killing him essentially not only killed the path to a so-called quote-unquote better deal with between Iran and the Americans, but rather it's going to increase hostilities and tensions both between Iran and the U.S. and as well between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Israel on the other hand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamid. Uh, Dr. Hamid actually left us with a few extra minutes for question and answer. I'm going to open up the floor for question and answer to Dr. Hamid. Yeah. So he, ha yeah, of course, he has to leave us immediately after. This is why. Okay. He will have. Allah, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, let us know who you are, and then try to keep a specific question. To do Abdullah, and then the gentleman over here, and the gentleman over here. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Uh, my name is Abdullah. I'm a PhD candidate here in, in this university, uh, as well as a research associate in the center. Uh, we're glad for having you. So I just want to keep it short. Uh, I was wondering, even the US even didn't mention about that, talked on that. In Afghanistan, in the, in, especially in the parliament, there's one of the MPs called Bilka Sushan. She was she was arguing that Qasem Soleimani was responsible of, of almost the killing of around 5,000 Afghan young uh, individuals, dominated from the from the Shiite minorities over there. So how how would this this wouldn't come to the picture? And neither the U.S. nor nor from the from the Iran side, nobody talked about that. Uh, although the Afghan media and the, and the Afghan society is, is mainly arguing and, and claiming that. Uh, what, what do you think on that? Thank you. We will have a second question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, the presentation was really quite clear regarding the position of Iran. Uh, my question is very much related to the Abdullah ones, but it's uh, regarding other neighboring countries as well. For example, the Pakistan and uh, the Turkey as well. So what are the expectations of the Iran from the Pakistan and the Turkey particularly? And do you think they will be able to be on the side of Iran or they will prefer to remain neutral, practically? It tends uh, to should I answer those questions and then we can move on to the next question? Go ahead. Just because I have, I have a bad memory, I'm going to forget it if there's more questions. Yes. Um, when it comes to Afghanistan and what Qasem Soleimani, so Qasem Soleimani essentially the Quds Force is the external wing of the IRGC and as a result Qasem Soleimani was very much involved in Iran's regional activities, whether it's, it was in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Syria or Yemen. And as you can imagine, um, based on that, you can imagine that people have very um, opposed views of, of who he was. So, so for example, in Afghanistan, uh, the Quds Force essentially was very much responsible um, to fight the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban is, even today, seen as an external threat to Iran, even though, interestingly enough, I saw that they actually issued a statement commemorating Qasem Soleimani, but still the Taliban um, is being seen as an ideological and very serious threat to Iran. And the Quds Force was involved in that. So as you can imagine, um, Qasem Soleimani, I would say perhaps, maybe you can comment on this, but regionally speaking, you had very opposing views of who he was. Internally within Iran, we don't really see that kind of, you know, two dual images of him. In, within Iran, he was really seen as a national hero. I mean, I have friends that even hate the Iranian government, but during the past week, they even attended his funeral in Tehran. Um, that shows how popular he was. Um, I usually go to all of the demonstrations, to the protests. I go to all of them just because I'm a, you know, I'm a political scientist. That my, that's my job. But, but, but his funeral procession in Tehran, what, I had never seen such a gathering in my entire life. Like it took me literally 
two hours to take this up. They just to go to a very short um, distance. And that was like, um, just to tell you how he was seen within Iran. Um, move on, moving on to the next question regarding other countries such as Pakistan and Turkey. Um, Iran's experience in the past year and a half has been a very bad experience. I'm, I'm trying to be very honest with you. I'll put the diplomacy aside. When, when the U.S. decided to leave the nuclear accord, many countries of the world essentially told Iran, this is, this is not right, this is legally wrong that the Americans are leaving the deal. We are going to help you. And this, this came from the Europeans, from Russia, from China, as well as from regional friends such as Turkey, Pakistan, Malaysia, other countries, etc. In reality, what happened was when so, so, so the sanctions on Iran, two of them are the most important sanctions. The first one is the sanction on Iran's financial system, which essentially makes it very difficult for Iran to make financial transactions with the world. It's, it's very significant because it essentially, it makes it difficult for Iran to import and export anything. The second part is the exportation of oil. Now, Iran's lifeline economic commodity that it exports is oil. After the JCPOA, Iran was exporting 2.5 million barrels per day. Right now, that figure is perhaps less than 200,000. Some countries, such as Turkey, were actually buying in oil. And when the Trump administration came and said that, you know, we are going to sanction this, Many countries said that we are not going to listen to the Americans, you know. We are going to continue with the purchase of Iranian oil. Right now, the only country in the world that is actually, actually buying Iranian oil still is China. So, it, it, part of that is because the Chinese have actually invested billions of dollars in Iranian oil fields, and the contract specifies that part of their return on investment would be Iranian oil. So, so even parts of the oil the Chinese are importing, they are not buying it from the Iranians. You do. I'm not sure if I conveyed what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a return on their investment based on the contract they signed. So essentially the result of what I'm explaining is during the past year, Iran has actually become isolated in the world. They really don't see anyone helping them. And when we talk about the Americans, you have to understand that the Americans are powerful, both in terms of economy and military, and Iran is, is regionally, I would say, isolated. If, again, we put the diplomacy aside, so, so uh, rhetorically a lot of global leaders are condemning this, they are saying, you know, this is wrong, we don't want this, you know, but, but in reality, nothing really much is happening on the ground in terms of so-called assisting Iran. Thank you very much. We have time for other questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for presentation. It was very good. Uh, my name is Sahin Azar. I am an undergraduate student in political science and international relations. So my question is very specific about uh, the Iran's position. Uh, you mentioned that after assass uh, yeah, pardon, after assassination, Iran's government uh, expressed that we are going to take our revenge. But you mentioned Iran has taken its revenge militaristically by attacking American base in Iraq. But uh, according to the news, no one died, and so it was just uh, an empty place that uh, Iran attacked. Uh, so my question is: this, Does it satisfy Iran? Is either Iran's government or people? And do you think it's going to keep Iran's reputation? Because uh, Iran's government mentioned that we're going to take revenge. But, the but in the news we see it's not only keeping the Iran's reputation, but also it's destroying, I think, because Iran just attacked and there was no place that uh, they argue that it was kind of deal between American government and Iranis that they are going to attack and keep that place empty. So what do you think about, how do you evaluate the situation? Okay, um, just to make sure I heard the question correctly because I wasn't really hearing it that well. So the question was regarding Iran's retaliation and whether it satisfies 
the government and the people and it's Iran's reputation. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so when when we talk about Iran's retaliation, it, I think it, it was a very tricky situation. From the if you look at this from the viewpoint of the Iranians, when I say tricky situation, in the sense that Iran wanted to send a very bold and direct signal to the Americans that if you hit us, we're going to hit you back. But at the same time, Iran just does not and did not want a whole scale war. Okay, so Iran does not want a war where you know the Americans, for example, bomb Iran's national infrastructure and we enter into a out of control conflict. So, 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 a lot of decision makers in Iran were thinking, how do we retaliate without escalating the situation? Why do they not want to escalate? Because any escalation would be seen as going towards a path of war between the two countries. And I mean, from the perspective of the Iranians, a full-scale war with the Americans would be very destructive. Now, now the attack on the American base, I think it, it was significant in the sense that, first of all, Iran hit the Americans directly and not through its proxies. So it didn't use, for example, Hezbollah, it was Iran itself. And also Iran directly attacked the Americans from its own soil, okay, so it wasn't through Iraq. But and also finally, in the sense that Iran directly took responsibility. Now, in terms of fatalities, the Iranians claim that there are fatalities and maybe the Americans are trying to cover it up. Um, the Americans are, of course, saying that the fatalities have been zero. Um, it's difficult to tell at this stage exactly, you know, we'll have to wait a few more days. I would say perhaps the fatalities are zero or maybe very few because I think it if there were a lot of fatalities, it would be very very difficult for the Americans to cover this up. <coughs> In regards to why the fatalities were very low, I think it's it's still too early to tell. There's a lot of discussion of what you just said within Iran as well among an analysts of why the fatalities were very low. Um, there are several theories about this. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the theories. I don't know which one is correct. I'm really, I'm, I, I don't have any experience in military issues, so maybe someone who's more of an expert on military issues could, could weigh in. But one theory is that Iran, Iran gave a heads up to the Iraqi government, to the Iraqi prime minister, and he notified the Americans. Now, one of the reason why this is a theory is we really don't know the timeline. So. Iran has confirmed that it did tell the Iraqi Prime Minister, um, but we don't know how early it did. So was it only a few minutes before the attack, or was it an hour before the attack? Okay, that's one, one theory. Another theory which the Americans have been very much discussing themselves was that as soon as Iran fired the missiles, they were able to detect them using their satellites, and they have a so-called early detection system. And they had a, a few minutes of time to take their troops into, you know, bunkers. And we have to remember that the Americans were on alert, right? I mean, even the day before Iran attacked, if you looked at news media of the American side, they were saying that the Pentagon is saying that there is going to be an attack in the next 24 to 48 hours. So, so, so the Americans were expecting this. Um, but, but again, going back to my point is that. I don't think Iran really wanted at this scale war with the Americans. Now, regarding reputation and all that, I really do think that this is this is not this is not ended. Okay, this was the last this was the last exchange of this round. If if you look at it in a boxing match, this was the first round. There are going to be more rounds. Okay. Um, this doesn't mean that Iran is going to attack a U.S. base in the coming weeks. We don't know what it's going to do, but essentially, as I said, it's a game changer in Tehran because right now, kicking the Americans out of the region is being really seen as a major Iranian foreign policy goal among different groups. And I'm not only talking about the conservatives now, different Iranian political factions. Sorry if that went on for too long. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Hamid for uh, his presentation. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hamid. Uh, that was enlightening, and we will continue with our uh, next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Hamid. you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sami. I'm, I'm very sorry that I have to leave. Um, during the past few days, I've really been so busy doing a lot of interviews and debates on channels, and uh, that's why I have to leave. So again, very sorry. I hope uh, it's a useful seminar, and I hope to see you all in person, maybe either in Istanbul or in Tehran, hopefully. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Sami. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll listen from Dr. Yassin outside. Uh, Dr. Yassin. Uh, Dr. Yassin, he is uh, from the University of Ankara. Dr. Yassin is also <laughs> currently serves as a member of the parliament for the I'm just sorry, not, not now. Not now. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, an ex-member of the parliament, and he also served as a senior advisor to its chair. Uh, Dr. Yassin uh, serves now as a professor at University of Ankara. Yeah. Um, in Ankara. Ah, in Ankara. In Ankara. Sorry about that. Uh, will Dr. Yassin will talk to us for about. 20 minutes. We'll follow that with Dr. Sami immediately and then conclude with a, a round of uh, question, questions and answers. <coughs> Thank you very much, first, for inviting me, Professor Sami and Anna, and all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa so, yeah. And of course, uh, the assassination of Qasim Soleimani has changed the rule of the game. I mean, it's a game changer, as I mentioned, stuff uh, after a <coughs> it is no doubt about this, uh, and uh, but I, I think you should suspect about something, right? Uh, because uh, I, we, we have some other scenarios about to how to read the situation in Iraq, in uh, Syria, in the Middle East in general, in terms of the relationship of the United States and, uh, and Iran. And uh, the, 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 apparently they are really fighters, they are really enemies of each other. They are, they are, they are very obvious hostility between the two. And uh, I am not doubting about this, there, there is of course. But something that we are witnessing uh, during these 40 years after the revolution of Iran, in terms of the relationship of Iran and Iran and, and, and the United States, there is some other <coughs> side effects of, of these hostilities side effects of this uh, of this relationship between the United States and America. And of course there is also Turkey, there is also some other actors. There is some, there are, uh, the, the, the Gulf countries, especially in the Saudi Arabia, Emirates and uh, other uh, Gulf <coughs> countries. In one scenario, there, there is one, uh, one, one aspect of this, uh, of this, uh, this, this, this platform, of, of this, this world, the Middle Eastern world, and also there is also another uh, site, uh, the Shia and Sunni uh, division uh, in, in, the, in the world. So we have also uh, the invasion of uh, the occupation of, uh, of Iraq in 2003 by United States America, and that the shift in the relationship between uh, very very obvious shift in the relationship between United States of America and Iran is also. Uh, giving us some other uh, clues or some other uh, impressions or some other, I mean, uh, connotations to think to, to think about in different way. Uh, I don't say, of course, I am not in the say, in, 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 in position of saying that oh, there is a conspiracy and there is a, a sort of agreement and, and secret agreement between the two, and whatever they are doing is only a conspiracy or is it is only an integral that making us believe something that they are, they are hostile, hostile but on the backstage indeed they are very good friends and they are in very good solidarity between, between each, each, each other that, that's not a good scenario and that is not working i think there is a real hostility between the between two I, I believe in it of course but the thing that we should notice that <coughs> from my point of view 
is that uh, there is also a functionality, a functionality of this hostility from uh, uh, for for both of them. Or I mean, both both sides are benefiting from this hostility in very very high way, so that they don't want to give up this hostility and they want they want to keep this hostility always always permanent I mean, because they are very they, it is very beneficial and like we can say we can show how everybody i think it's no it is very obvious now that now now this information became very non information very non fact fact that in in, in the relationship of united states and uh, iran Especially when we see, when we see, for example, Qasem Soleimani was a very, very important figure. It is no doubt about this. There is no doubt, and uh, he was a very charismatic figure. And he was not. He was, as as is mentioned, and you now we are everybody is more, much more aware of his uh, all qualities of his personality and uh, his personality and his activities. Of course, uh, he had activities. He was. Uh, if, if he, he should be, if, if he can be compared, I think he's, 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 he's of course, uh, hierarchically is under the uh, Wali Fakih uh, Amenei, but I think in, 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 in effectivity and in activity he was, he was more effective than uh, even than Khamenei. If, if, uh, so that, for example, uh, just to give the, uh, <coughs> to give the, uh, I mean the, the reality. Um, if if Khamenei is ruling Iran, uh, Qasem Soleimani was ruling Libya. Uh, sorry, he was ruling uh, Syria. He was ruling Iraq. He was ruling Afghanistan. He was ruling Yemen. And he was ruling, ruling also uh, Lebanon. And he was a very big influence, very profound influence within Iran also. So I think he was person he was much more stronger than Khamenei in it. And this is why somebody is told that he's, he's, he would be successor of uh, Khamenei. He was the, the only one who, who had that natural right to, to, to be a successor of Khamenei. And uh, of course, when we talk about all negative policies of Iran in the Middle East, uh, he was also responsible of this because if, if Iran was him. him himself. I mean, uh, he, was, he was the face of Iran in all of these countries. And he, uh, we, 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 we heard from him himself also, he was very proud on, on the name of Iran to be ruling the, the four Sunni capitals. I mean, he, he was mentioning Beirut, Damascus, uh, Baghdad, and Sana'a. And you, you can uh, probably uh, add to them Afghanistan. Of course, his influence in Afghanistan is not like comparably, compared, compared to not, not like uh, the other uh, former uh, four countries. But he was uh, he had also influence uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan also. That is one uh, thing. When we when we see how he, he gained this influence, keep a like uh, uh, keep. keep I mean, aside his influence or his role in, in Syria, or Iran's role in Syria, when you talk about Suleiman, you talk about Iran. He, he, he was created or he was identified I mean, there is a, a, a sort of identification with him, Iran's role. And, uh, but uh, let's talk about Iraq. Uh, Iraq, Iran's role in Iraq uh, started in 2003. In, and it was in parallel with the occupation, and, and whatever role has Iran in Iraq, is, it was opened, and all the space was opened by the United States. I think there is there is some some uh, some uh, plan of the United States to divide the Muslim world in general, the vision of Shia and Sunni. And this is of course that we we, we we are against. Of course, we, we, we are as Muslims. We are we, we are always talking about the unity of the Muslims in general. We are against any any, any sort of sectarianism in the Muslim world, and uh, we 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 all grab in with, with the books of Ali Sharati, the books uh, even uh, the, the, the revolution Islamic revolution was making us very very um, uh, excited. It was exciting us. Uh, because we were we, we, we were anti-American because of the slogans and the mottos that we, we, we heard from the Iranian Revolution, etc. Uh, so uh, essentially, we cannot be against Iran, and we were always we have 
if we, 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 we are in position to be, to be mentioned in terms of I mean, prejudgment about Iran, or prejudgment was a very positive prejudgment. We had very positive prejudgment toward to Iran. Uh, it's, it was ne not negative. We have we have opened very big credits, very huge credit to to Iran, because we heard all the, the, all slogans or the discourses we were hearing from from Iran was sounding very well for us. Uh, the unity of the Muslim, the the, the, the the message of Imam Khomeini when he was talking about the unity of the Ummah and to be, to be a one front and united front against. Against against Israel, they were all very sounding very well, and they, they were welcomed by the <coughs> Turkish Muslims in general. Not to talk about other Islamists of Egypt or Islamists in any other part of the Muslim world, but especially I am I am very aware, and I grew up in this situation, in this atmosphere, I mean, in this ideological atmosphere. Atmosphere. So uh, we were in the position to be very positive to Iran. I mean, but whatever we saw, we saw, unfortunately, it was very, very disappointing uh, in, Iran, in Turkey. Let me say, talk about other story, of course. Where, I mean, I mean, uh, not to say parallel story, but story within a, uh, the, the general story. The Turkish stand I and mean, the Turkish governments, which were, which is ruled by AK Party, uh, to Iran, it was really very, very positive. I mean. And we, 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 we uh, know that there is a memory in, in, uh, in, in uh, it is a memorized information from Iranian side that Turkey is part of NATO. And so it, uh, at the end it will sell us, just as we heard from, the, from, from Mr. Dr. Dabba, uh, Musari, that he, he's saying that oh, we, we were dis he, he is talking about disappointment of Turkish stand in, in, the, in the deal <coughs> or in the sanctions of United States and Turkey <coughs> Turkey didn't I mean, pro didn't follow its promise for example. No, it, 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 Turkey didn't promise this and Turkey was were insisting on being and taking stand against Iran against United States sanctions. Uh, and up, yeah, I mean, it's very, very, it was very, very clear. And even Turkey, uh, by discourse, resisted, criticized the United States, and said it is very wrong, these sanctions. We are not on the side of these sanctions. But if we, <coughs> that there, is, there is a power also, there is a power of the world. And if you resist and you, 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 become, I mean, you become marginalized, and if you become marginalized, your economy is destroyed. And we have no that economy to, to, to resist, for example. Unfortunately, we have no that economy to resist against the United States, for example, and to say, uh, to, to, to say, we don't, we don't acknowledge you, we don't recognize your 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 words or your sanctions, and we are taking our, our side beside uh, Iran. And okay, if if we st if we take this and your your bank system is unfortunately is bankrupted and is is cancelled and you cannot do anything you become Iran probably get familiarized with the sanctions for 40 years from now. Since, since 40 years they are they had uh, they adapted their economy they accommodate their economy to be I mean available or to be resisting to the to to, to that uh, sanctions etc. But Turkey is not that country. Turkey is a democracy and democracy is a real democracy. There is no, for example, if, if something a, a little bit more uh, fall the, the walls of AK Party, and ne next time JHP will come to power and it, it will rule Turkey. And so you, are, you have to rule the country in the limits of uh, democracy, and you cannot. The, the, the thing that is expected from Turkey by Iran is something that which Iran didn't show to Turkey that solidarity, that solidarity. No matter, unfortunately. When Turkey was, for example, faced, facing many, many attacks from the United States or from any, many parts, unfortunately, we didn't see Iran besides us. And uh, the, the preferences or the policies that uh, Iran had followed so far was giving us other impression, where other Clues that it, it was following, it was considering Turkey as its rival, its competitor, rather than as its part a partner in solidarity against Zionism or against yes, we are also against against Zionism, as we are really very genuine, uh, genuine uh, part of uh, anti-Zionism as Turkey. Not to talk about AK Party only in general Turkey, with, even with CHP also. CHP also in general Turkish country Turkish people are against Zionism 
And the, 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 the anti-party against the United States in Turkey is not less, it, not less than 80%, 80, 85%. It's sometimes at about 90%, the anti-US, let me say. Anti-Zionism is more than 40, uh, uh, 95% in Turkey. And nobody can blame Turkey for being or it is, it is part of NATO, so it's with, with, with Zionism. No, Turkey is, especially after after a party came to power, they are they 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 followed much more uh, policies more closer to United to, to Iran or to Islamic world in general. And what we said, for example, in 2009 there was a, uh, a voting in the uh, United Nations Nation, uh, Security Council. Turkey was the only country which stand against the United States and it said no to the United States. And it was very risky for Turkey in, the, in terms of I mean, sanctions against Iran in terms of, uh, because of the, uh, its nuclear pro program. And we, 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 we defended that, that thesis that we said nobody has the right to nuclear, nuclear weapon, but everybody has the right to nuclear program. Nuclear program is the right for everybody, but nuclear weapon is the right for nobody. That, that was very good, very interesting, very, very strong thesis. It was an ethical thesis also to be defended. And if you if you are talk about the, the, the program, uh, the uh, nuclear program of uh, of Iran for the future, for example, the possible uh, nuclear weapon in the future. Let's talk about the, the existing the existing weapons in Israel, for example. And we open these files in, 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 a, in a sort of challenge to the world. And we stand uh, beside Iran in this, in this. That was a solidarity. And, we, and because of this solidarity, we, we saw, for example, Saudi Arabia become, be, began to, to suspect about Turkey and they, they adjust their policies against Turkey, making some conspiracies against Turkey. Then many, many things that happened from Saudi Arabia's <coughs> side also. And uh, unfortunately, we, we, we didn't see that uh, any amount of solidarity from Turkey. And Turkey stand against these sanctions also. They followed their, their program, their, their exchange, and the exchange of uh, uh, many things. I mean, I mean we, 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 we opened and we kept some, uh, some, some, some doors or some uh, spaces in bank system, etc., with, with Iran open and to be a, a, a sort of bypassing some, some sanctions. And we helped Iran, and we were in solidarity with Iran. Of course, we are we were also benefiting from this. Not to say for just for solidarity. It's not just for solidarity, of course. But it, if uh, we, we had other options, for example, to keep just we were very loyal to our alliance with United States or with NATO or the Western world, and we, we keep uh, Iran alone. No, we we didn't we didn't leave uh, Iran alone. Just on the contrary, the the ideological base of this solidarity in Turkish side was Muslims, was Islam, and was the Islamic Brotherhood. And uh, you, you can, for example, criticize, many people are criticizing Recep Tayyip Erdogan, I mean, the leader of Turkey now, because of his naive, naive uh, sentiments or feelings in believing in brotherhood, in international policies. And somebody, everybody, every, every day, somebody are on, besides him to, 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 to try to teach him some uh, realistic policies or to be realist in, in international policies. Uh, but he resisted you know, he refused all these lessons or, the, or these messages from everybody. And he says, no, we are brothers, we should keep, etc. He's very, really, very naive. And I know his naivety. And this naivety is, I think, is, 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 this sincerity in, in, uh, is unbelievable things in, 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 uh, indeed. But it, that is the reality. And uh, we, we, we were hoping to see some uh, 10 percent, not 1 percent uh, from Iran inside this sincerity in the, in, the, in the region. Unfortunately, if after the Arab Spring took place, if Iran was sincere, it, the, we had many chances to make, for example, very good cooperation, coordination, solidarity with them in order to, to, to organize what, whatever happened with Egypt, with Iran, and we, 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 might, we might have constituted a very, very good Muslim world, very good united Muslim world. And Turkey tried to do it by itself and tried to, do, to, 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 to uh, extend its hand uh, to Iran also to say, let's work together in order to cooperate. But with what we saw, especially when, when the Arab Spring waves came to, 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 to Syria, 
the same thing, the same dialogue was taking place between, uh, between us. And he said, why you are insisting in Assad? Assad is of or uh, ally also, okay? But because he is Shia, and he, they, they, they tried to defend him, they tried to, to, to keep him in power, and be in, in, in spite of all his crimes, all, the, all his crimes he committed, and he, uh, he was uh, <coughs> defended by Iran, and we saw we, we offered many many options to Iran. We said we said we can we can go together. We can even we can defend Assad's rights also. If if you are for if if you have some some uh, some obligations to, to to Assad, for example, we can keep his rights, and he will he will be a very respectful guy for the future. Or even he 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 can keep in power, but not to make it commit these massacres in, in, against his country. And we were not, for example, eager to revolt uh, Assad. We advised Assad to, to behave to the protesters in a very peaceful way, not to make commit these massacres, otherwise we would not be able to defend him. And uh, you know the pressure, oppression of our Turkey for, uh, for, for, for leaving Assad and for making him uh, not, to, not, not to go much more in, in details, but we didn't see solidarity with Iran. Just on the contrary, they they saw that a sort of I mean they 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 they, they, they interrupted all all the dialogue with Turkey and they 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 they, they, they for the sake for the sake of keeping the front against Zionism, they 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 mass they, they massacred or, or or they sacrificed million people in Syria, million people in Syria, and. Uh, 12 million people are now refugee, in, they are not uh, in their home, and also Iraq is the same story, unfortunately. And in, in Iran, the, the, the division of I mean, the division of uh, sectarian the war that were, 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 was uh, opened by uh, by Iran, uh, unfortunately, uh, brought uh, Iran to the, brought Iraq to this. Now, what we see, the functionality, I talk about the benefit of this hostility between the United States and Iran. And even in the last, we can see the, the evidences, or the, let me not, not to say evidence, but to say the signs of this functionality. And you know, just before, get, let's go just a little, back, a little bit back to the uh, to, to past, I mean, before uh, this, this assassination. Before uh, you can, you can. There was a discussion within Iraq. Not discussion. There was some demonstrations, and there was. Uh, it was uh, Iraq uh, almost had, had had become an <coughs> ungovernable country. Because of, and and this problem, the problem from Iran point of view, from Iranian point of view, from the existing statico, status quo, was that for the first time the Shia were revolting. For the first time. And uh, so, far, I mean, he, he felt the the, the 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 Sunni part were, were and it, it was keep it was very easy to to handle. It was to, it was very easy to copy. They say no, they are the Saddam's heirs, and they are Saddam's sons, and uh, the, the old regime people, and they are with America, and you you, you can and you push them, and you can you can handle the issue the, the, the issue. But now. The, the, the Shia are revolting. Why? Because the, 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 the colonization of Iraq by Iran, the, there is a very, very obvious colonization of Iran. There is not, for example, during our young uh, periods, I mean, uh, when we were young and we were revolutionary, even Iranian revolution, we were supposed to be Iran Iranists. We were supposed to be communists. Uh, and at that time, for example, Exporting revolution, I mean, the motto of exporting revolution was very exciting for us. Iran would export the revolution. That, that means, I mean, the, revol the model of Islamic country to be exported to other countries. But with what? With, with some values, institutions, very positive, good, with the goodness. But now, we, 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 yes, we see the, the, the export of revolution. It is not export of revolution. It is export of uh, influence only, export of That's interests. Right. And it is a sort of exploitation, unfortunately. I and mean, Iraq became to be exploited by, by, by <coughs> Iran. The only thing that is in, uh, inter interesting Iran in Iraq is it, its oil. Its uh, I mean, its its area to be uh, a sort. Of, okay. And 
Now, uh, this revolt by Shia, for example, uh, it was very dangerous for Iran. It was, uh, it was it become to be uh, interrogated. I mean, questioned its uh, its influence, its existence in Iraq side, Iraq's area became uh, questioned, and this question uh, was, I mean, knocking the door of the end of the, I mean, the end of the way for Iraq, for, for for Iran. I would ask at that time, for example, what could save Iran in, in that situation, I mean, in that scene, or in that atmosphere? What, 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 what might have happened, something I mean, to, 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 to save Iran from this uh, paradox, or from this, 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 this uh, black, uh, I mean, black ants, or, and, what, and uh, I think, the assassination of uh, of, of, of Qasem Soleimani uh, worked in this way. They, it, it united Iraq on the, uh, under the flag of Shia again, mm -hmm. under the flag of Iranism again, mm -hmm. and also uh, it united uh, Iran, uh, Iran's revolutionary or regime uh, sentiments under under uh, by, by by this way, as he mentioned. I mean, Mr. Mohammed uh, mentioned this. He said uh, it, it is unbelievable. He, he, he never uh, had seen uh, such a meeting or such a broad crowd and gathered uh, for, for this. They were also confirmed their loyalty to the regime. And this a sort of maintenance of the regime became, became uh, a reality. I don't, I don't say, of course, it has nothing to do with uh, something with the uh, with, with United States uh, elect electoral process, of course. The United States electoral process and some parts of the United States always has benefited from this. What is happening in the Middle East, not only from Iran and Iran, especially uh, the uh, attack on the uh, embassies. Uh, embassy has a very, very, very tragic memory in uh, in United States memory. If we had tragic, tra tragic place in the uh, uh, United States memory, and this also played an another role. Of course, what happened is very uh, Turkey didn't uh, agree and it will not agree and of course it, it is against such assassinations against such uh, such uh, activities of United States Turkey is not refraining from criticizing and even attacking United States if you follow I think I'm not to be humble about my articles in United in Yanisha Fak also in, in they are trans, being translated into Arabic and English also every day I am attacking uh, uh, America and I am attacking also sometimes Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran also. I, I'm, we are very openly criticizing so, uh, United States existence and policies in the uh, in the region. And we say <coughs> the best the best thing for United States for from our point of view to be out of there, out of Uni uh, Middle East, because the very existence of United States in, you know, in in the Middle East is the very reason of all crises or all of all problems in the in, in, in the region. And they are not here for, for the benefit of the people of the Middle East, but they are here for creating a chaos, what we say, creative chaos. And this creative chaos is not good for us, inshallah. Uh, everything. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yassin. Thank you for this insightful uh, speech. It was interesting to hear this from an informed opinion about, about the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the position of Turkey, and also uh, the development of the Turkish-Iranian uh, relationships, despite, despite the, the, the Turkish will to, to, to bring things closer. But there seems, according to, to Professor, there seems an Iranian uh, hidden agenda of some kind. Uh, thank you very much. We will hear now from Dr. Sami al uh, Dr. Sami is the director of SIGA, Center for Islam and Global Affairs, and he is also uh, the professor of public affairs at Sabah al Zain University. Uh, inshallah, we'll hear from Dr. Sami about a more global perspective. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's very nice to see all of you. Lenin once said, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. And you just witnessed in the past couple of years, <coughs> in the past couple of weeks, 
where decades actually happen. Not since 1943 has the United States assassinated a general. We're talking about close to eight decades. Uh, not talking about assassination, because the US obviously assassinates every year different people. We're talking about assassinating openly military general. And not since 1945, where an American base is being directly hit, announced from another country, as Professor Musa was saying, this was an attack by an Iranian missile, openly, from a uh, from a rocket launcher all the way to to military base. A lot of things have been said that this was really nothing. You know, what is it that uh, uh, no casualties, no, no, nobody's being killed, and people were making jokes about it. I want you to think about this. America is the superpower. It's the number one uh, world power. <coughs> and someone is actually telling them, I'm going to hit you. Just imagine what the U.S. would have done in other circumstances. They would say, you're going to do what? Before even you launch it, you will be <coughs> taken, destroyed, taken out of the face of the earth. So they leaked it. They leaked that they would be hitting American bases in Iraq to the Iraqis, knowing that the Iraqis will leak it to the Americans. So what do the Americans do? Do they stand up and say, I dare you to hit us, and if you hit us, we'll do this and that? They go and hide. American soldiers, thousands of them, go and hide, actually. And once the dust settles, the, 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 the missiles have been shot and landed, they come out and say, oh, we haven't been killed, we haven't been injured. That's great. That is not a sign of superpower, actually, even though it's been spent the other way. That's something that is indeed uh, something new. So the rules of engagement have been, have been changed. What I'm going to do in the few minutes I have is try to review the relationship between the U.S. and Iran for the past 40 years, at least since the revolution, they was basically a little bit back, and then try to conclude with some uh, conclusions. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over what, what you see here, obviously, is, is Iraq. Iran is a big country. If you put together France, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Portugal, and Spain, all these countries together, Iran is bigger than all of them combined. Iran is bigger than twice Turkey. So it's a huge country. It's not something that is simple. Sorry. And um, this was a different lecture, so I'm not going to bore you with this. Uh, but I want to show you. This is what Iran is facing. If you're sitting in Tehran, this is what you see. You're seeing over 43 military bases that you're surrounded with. And that's what the US has been building for decades. Almost every neighboring country has few bases. All American bases. American bases. All of them. All of them. That does not even count the ships, the submarines, the, 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 the other forces that do exist. In 1953, there was a, there was a uh, uh, Iran had a popular prime minister who was trying to nationalize oil. Iran had been under the, the rule of the Shah, first the father, then the son, Reza Bahnavi. And then it was obviously ruled with, with an iron fist. Then there were elections, there was a popular prime minister, and he was trying to nationalize oil, where the Americans and the, and, and the British were trying to control. The US had a coup, similar to other coups at the time, and they were over to, to topple that person, and actually he was tried and executed and they supported the Shah and the secret police for decades. That culminated into the popular Islamic revolution in 1979, which really changed, changed the system. As it changed the system, the U.S. suffered because of the U.S. interest in the area. Bear in mind that in 1971, U.S. President uh, Richard Nixon, uh, he was tired of policing the world because they were deep into Vietnam and they were suffering lots of casualties. So he basically instituted a new policy in the region where he was depending on keeping political and, and security order in the hands of local clients. 
Iran was one of these local clans under the Shah. And he, 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 the Shah was in charge of keeping stability in the Persian Gulf. And immediately he seized two, two islands that were off uh, the United Arab Emirates. At any rate, I don't want to go too much into history. I just want to set up what we had before the revolution. We had the, the Shah of Iran was very much unlike the United States. He bought billions of dollars of weapons. He was given that charge that he would keep security and political order in the area, the status quo in that area for the benefit of the United States. Revolution came, that order was collapsing. And they started actually taking hostile uh, actions dating back to the 1953 coup. Khomeini always was talking about this as being the, one of the, of, the, of the consequential events that, that changed the course of Iranian history. And he was very bitter towards the Americans because of that. The US, uh, shortly after the revolution, Iraq invaded Iran uh, for its own reasons. And the US, for eight years, was supporting Iran clandestinely. In addition, uh, the US clients in the region, Kuwait in particular, gave Saddam Hussein $80 billion toward that war. And Saudi Arabia and the Emirates gave them $40 billion. That's $120 billion that was given to Saddam Hussein to fight Iran. For eight years, this was taking place over a million casualties on both sides. All that is in the background is in the psyche of Iran, Iranians. So Qasem Soleimani came out of that. I mean, he, 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 he came to prominence because he was considered a brave fighter against Iraqis for these eight years. And he was obviously promoted until he reached the, the, the rank of being in charge of the Quds uh, forces in 1998. As the Iranians, got out of that war, <coughs> they were under sanctions. They were military, uh, they were armed sanctions. They got buy uh, weapons from outside. So they had to pretty much depend on themselves. <coughs> uh, the Most of the, of the countries, the regional uh, neighbors, they were involved in that war. And that had a lot of hostility. Uh, towards towards both sides. Indeed, there has become a rivalry, not only in military terms and political terms, but also from an Islamic perspective. You know, between Saudi Arabia representing the Sunni world and Iran representing the Shia world, but also Iran trying to project itself as an Islamic, uh, with an Islamic ideology, as an as an Islamic popular. Uh, ideology that is coming to 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 not only service the, the, the what they call the Muslim the, 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 the wretched of the world, but also to be at the forefront of the fight against imperialism represented by the U.S. and Zionism represented by Israel. And indeed, since '82, even in the midst of the uh, Iraq-Iran war, they started building that power. Uh, it started with the Revolutionary Guards, and then. Went uh, from that they established what is called the Quds Force, that was led by Soleimani. So they established their own. They they they, they uh, took advantage of the 1982 invasion of Le of Israel to to Lebanon, and they established a, a force there that over the years became what we know today as Hezbollah. Today Hezbollah is the product of that involvement. Hezbollah is the product of the Quds Force or the uh, Revolutionary Guards. Uh, they spent literally billions of dollars building it. Today you have over 50,000 fighters at least, as well as maybe 150,000 rockets. They also extended their influence because they, one of their, uh, one of their models, one of their slogans, one of their things is that we are going to confront Zionism. So they backed that up by uh, providing arms and support, financial support and otherwise to the Palestinian groups such as Hamas and and jihad in, in, in Gaza and, and other places. So all that obviously does not endure them to the American man. You're talking about now Iran being trying to, to, to not only compete for influence, but also to directly threaten US interests. Uh, 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 you know, I don't even have the time to go over many incidents, but I'm trying to project a picture for you. On the other hand, you know, from the way they see, I'm, I'm going to tell you how they see it from how the Iranians see Washington and how Washington sees Tehran. So from the point of view of Washington, you have Iran that is trying to extend its influence, that's trying to challenge the, the, the security order, that it has changed its, its, um, 
its role in, in the region, that it is directly threatening the, the clients of the US or the allies of the US, however you want to characterize them, whether it is Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, that uh, uh, from uh, uh, the perspective of, of the, the Zionists or those who support Israel also, it is directly challenging Israel, lots of hot rhetoric. It's the only one in the world that is actually backing up rhetoric with actions. They don't mind act, uh, rhetoric, but with actions, they're actually giving support, they're giving arms, they're giving technology to these groups that are fighting Israel. That's all very dangerous, uh, uh, not only for Israel, but also for the uh, decision makers in Washington. So that, that's how it becomes the uh, supporter of terrorism uh, throughout the world. So that very early on, Iran was not looked up uh, kindly by, by the US. And when Clinton came to power in 92, they instituted what he called dual containment policy. Dual containment meant that we were not going to allow Iran or Iraq. That's why it's called dual. Because Iraq, by that time, after it invaded Kuwait, it became obviously uh, they reversed that with the invasion of, or with the war against Saddam, that stayed for about six weeks. He was defeated. He, he, he withdrew from Kuwait. And they instituted this dual containment that we're going to contain Iran, contain Iraq. They were able to contain Iraq, but they couldn't contain Iran. Uh, Iran was recognized throughout the 80s and, and the early 90s as being a victim of the Iraqi aggression. Uh, Iraq did actually indeed use chemical weapons against it, and they were building their soft power as well as hard power. So they were not, even though they were under sanctions, they were not in the same severe sanctions that Iraq was under. Over time, after the 1990s, as, as they extended, they were able to advance in technology, including uh, a power, a nuclear power technology. Where in the US, and of course Israel that is watching very carefully what, what Iran is doing, it became obviously a threat. Because to Israel, one of the ex existential threats is having any uh, neighboring country, uh, the, the uh, nuclear power. That's, that to them is, is a red line that they will not. So you could see them, they hit Iraq, they hit Syria, they, they, they even thought about hitting Pakistan in 84. But that is something that, so Iran was elevated more now into the, 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 uh, the threat that Israel presents as they were presenting Iraq at one point, as they were presenting uh, Syria at another point, as they were presenting Mossad back in the 60s. All these were considered existential threats. So before, right before 9-11, there was a lot of talk about how they're going to deal with the Iranian threat. Of course, 9-11 came, then we had new calculations. The new calculations were that uh, uh, the neocons, who were in charge of the White House at that time, under George W. Bush, uh, they thought about basically changing the whole political order. And to change the, polit the political order, they were thinking about going first through Afghanistan, because that's where the threat was emanating, then Iraq. And then they had seven countries in a row. And that was actually written and, and exposed and well known. Uh, and Iran was one of these. So Iran, for, for, uh, for uh, a little while, <coughs> basically was worried that it could face or would have to face and it was, you know, at the time there was a lot of anger about the United States. So they helped in a way what was a resistance, what came as out of the resistance of Iraq. Not because they were for the resistance, but to lock down the US. And they took advantage after Saddam Hussein was toppled and the Shia groups became the rulers of Iraq as the Sunnis were put down because they were perceived as being the supporters of Saddam Hussein, that this was a golden opportunity. From their point of view, it was a huge strategic mistake. And of course, the, the United States did not realize their strategic mistake until much later. So that, that's, why how they, how, that's how you see, see alliances shifting in Iraq because of, of these things. But they took advantage of that, of course, as uh, uh, Dr. Hamid said that Taliban was looked at basically as, uh, uh, as enemies of, of Iran, so they helped to topple them basically, and they, that gave them also another another uh, angle into into uh, getting involved in, in Afghanistan. But now in Iraq, they became the the, the the huge influencer in terms of policy, in terms especially that the Shiites now were in power, and the Sunnis were were basically deposed. Uh, 
as this was happening, the Iranian technology, Iranian arms industry, Iranian influence was expanding. And one of the major reasons for that is the Quds Force. As both of our speakers were pointing out, I mean, they, they, uh, uh, they expanded. Now you could look at this from different perspectives. One perspective is that this is about Iranian empire, uh, about the Persian Empire. So this is about building an empire and, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, from the standpoint of the Iranians, uh, especially those who are more aligned with the Islamic revolutionary uh, theology, which is, you know, the, uh, the Wali al-Faqih or the government, because Iran also has different different factions, so you cannot say it's just Iran, and, but we mean the people in charge who are making decisions. From the standpoint <coughs> is that we are here representing Islam, revolutionary Islam per se, and we are here to confront imperialists, we are here to confront Zionists, and therefore we are going to uh, pursue that, and we put our mouth, you know, we, we put our uh, uh, money where, where our mouth is, and, and we're backing this up with, with the, you know, with these forces, with these militias that are toppling governments, and of course, uh, confronting Israel. Of course, the big question was what happened in Syria. That's a completely different question that need to be addressed actually in different context. But that's to, 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 from the U.S. That's that's very dangerous path. If they start changing these regimes, these are regimes that the United States has pledged for decades to protect, whether in Saudi Arabia or the Emirates or the or Kuwait or others, and so on, and, and specifically Israel, which is one of the pillars of the US policy, is to keep Israel and actually guarantee its survival. So now you have you have two camps. You have the camp that is trying to confront Zionism and imperialism, which is leading Iran. No other regime in the area would actually be in, in, in openly with, with Iran, even if, they, if some may sympathize here and there, but no one's going to be openly with them. So all they were basically uh, depending on are non-state actors. Uh, as I said, uh, principally when it comes to Israel, it's all and Jihad. On the other hand, you have uh, other regimes that were openly against Iran very early on, from the 1980s. Uh, of course, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, um, Kuwait, and so on, Jordan, and, and of course Egypt, whether under Sadat or Mubarak. By the way, there are no, there hasn't been, uh, Iran only cut its, its relationship with two countries. By the way, didn't even cut its relation with, with, with the US. Israel and Egypt after Hamdan. And it hasn't, they haven't had any relationship with Egypt ever since. And again, under the rhetoric that this is about the organization. At any rate, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Wow. Okay. All right. So the question is, are we going to see hostilities? Now, you know, I wanted to walk you through actually what happened after that, but we don't have the time. So let me just conclude with this. <coughs> what, are, what is the future of the Middle East? After, after the Arab Spring movement, so clearly, especially after 2013, the Egyptian coup, after the counter-revolutionary forces. Now, it's very clear that what we have today, of course, what Iran, Iran's position towards that is <coughs> mixed. And I don't have time to go through the analysis. But now that we have counter-revolutionary forces, which are strongly you know, against the, the popular movements, strongly in the camp, in the, in the, in the camp of the US and Israel, uh, these are, in, from, from, from an American perspective, very important, uh, very important countries and actors in confronting Iran. Iran became a threat after the, 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 the uh, after they demonstrated that they were capable of reaching a, a nuclear power. Obama made the hard assessment that we cannot stop it, but we can delay it. The neocons, the Israelis. Uh, those who are friends of Israel, the right, the evangelicals, did not like that one bit. They wanted to stop Iran or change the, have regime change. Actually, they, in the 1990s, the same people were in charge of Congress for a couple of years, or actually for four years at the time, and they actually uh, funded hundreds of millions of dollars for opposition groups. There are many, many hostilities. So all those who think that you know, this is a game, they're you know, playing with each other, it's just the, the, the facts do not bear this out. What we are seeing today 
as I said, as I started my, my, my remarks, is something that is going to be new because I think the, U, the, the Iranian policy now is to drive the U.S. from the Middle East. They're not going to do it directly because they are too weak to do so. They cannot, Iran cannot engage in a military confrontation directly with the U.S. Even though if they were forced, they will. And they will probably inflict huge damage. But it's very difficult to see a direct, unless you, you, uh, you define the winning in a narrow term. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, so they're trying to drive the U.S. From, from, from the Middle East. They would have to use all kinds of different tactics, including using non-state tactics. On the other hand, what the U.S. wants is to stop completely the nuclear program, meaning that it will never be reenacted, because they thought that was a loophole, at least for Trump people. But also try even to have regime change, or some sort of a continuous containment of Iran, where they cannot project any kind of influence or power throughout the Middle East. These are completely two different objectives that cannot be reconciled. One of them would have to, to win, one, one of them would have to, to prevail. Uh, obviously, for that to happen, there will be a lot of other actors, including Turkey, about how this will be borne out, yeah, about what's going to happen on the Israeli front, because Israel is a, is a, is a big question mark. You know, the, the, whenever you have a direct um, <coughs> involvement of Israel or direct confrontation with Israel, uh, usually the, the popular support is going to tilt against Israel. So if Iran is on that out or, or its, its supporters, that is going to, to, to be huge. Uh, will have a huge impact on that. Uh, what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia, the succession, what's going to happen in the region, and, and also there will be a lot of things happening in the near future, and by near future, I'm talking about the next two, three years, but also over the long term, we're even talking about the next decade. Uh, how that's going to, what's going to happen, how, what's going to happen, that, that will all depend on the different alliances that are being formed. Uh, we've seen also that Part of the U.S., as, as uh, Dr. Akhtai uh, said, is, is to try to inflame the Shia Sunni uh, divide. So this is something that we'll try to push very, very hard. How that's going to also be dealt with? How, what would be the reaction? You know, just looking at some of the reactions I've seen in the past couple of days, this is an issue that is still very, very much alive. And it could very much be exploited by those who would like to see this, this sectarian war enraging uh, in the Muslim world. So let me just uh, say finally, uh, Iran and, and, and the US will continue to be hostile powers. Uh, there, are, there are certain advantages uh, for each side. They will try to outmaneuver each other. Uh, they have definite strategic objectives. Why Trump chose to hit Soleimani now is an interesting situation. I believe it has to do a lot with trying to change, because what Iran was trying to do is to get out of these sanctions. So it's, it's, it it's was like uh, rattle, uh, saber rattling the United States, doing all kinds of things without being caught. And I think he wanted to, 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 to hit Soleimani in order, uh, Soleimani in order to uh, uh, see how the Iranians would, would react and try to, to, to force them into negotiations. Uh, but also he was trying to get out of there because that's what, that was the last option that he was given by the Pentagon, and, he is, and yet he got it. But I think he was also trying to change the conversation on impeachment, and I think he was, uh, he was able to do that. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, we saw how that turned out, and I think now we're going to see an open hostility. Uh, it's not going to be a war, I don't believe. It's going to be an open facility to drive the U.S. out, and the U.S. Will, will, will increase the pressure on Iran in order to either have a deal change or crumble or, or somehow uh, force it into negotiations. So these are the, the situations, and we can probably get some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we have about 30 minutes to, for question and answer. I would like just to have one remark before we open. So it was very clear from the speakers that uh, there is a question mark on what is the future, what is the future of the Middle East, and maybe just maybe uh, Dr. Atkai, if you can uh, give us a remark on 
And Turkey's position when it comes to being neutral as, as a Muslim state, let me say, New, and, and neutral Islam. Like not really, not, not really, or, or not very clearly uh, derived to that position or that position. And then when we talk about uh, the future of the Middle East, driving, driving the United States out of the area is obviously now Iran's position. And with this Shiri Sunni background, we would have, because when you look at this, most of those stars are maybe in in Muslim majority, uh, Sunni majority states. So uh, I would like to hear from both of our speakers maybe an extended opinion on the, the Shiri Sunni division. <coughs> How will that play a role in, in, the, in the near future? OK, we'll have a few questions. Uh, first round. Okay. First question back there, gentlemen. Back. Okay. Second. Okay. Let's start with the gentleman. Yes. Uh, My name is Ali Yao. I'm um, a political science student. My question to Mr. Sami: um, Do you think the U.S. is not uh, now a threat to the Middle East? A special outspoken activist who. Uh, I mean, here, U.S. threat to what? Do you think the U.S. It's not now a threat to the Middle East, especially uh, outspoken activists who, who, who may want to be like uh, Suleiman who was just assassinated last week, and also other parts of the world. And uh, what do you think the Middle East will do now um, in order to, to stop that collectively? And what will be the role of the international community uh, in this, because I, I think this violation of international law for U.S. to assassinate uh, uh, Doctor um, I mean Suleiman. Okay. Let's take another question. Dr. Uh, Samia, you have two questions, straight and uh, so short for you. The first one is all. I mean, all of these bases. Do you really think these are against Iran? The question number two, is this contemporary Iran healthy for the region? Is this Iran right now that we have, is it healthy for the region? Healthy, for, okay. healthy yeah, for the region, the Middle East time. Okay, let's go on the line and get the responses from us. Thank you, Dr. Brahman. Uh, my question for Professor Akhtai, uh, to make it short. So you talk about the, the hot party position and you your personal stand on, on the, on the Iran, the, the Turkish approach being an optimistic, having an optimistic approach, despite the, the kind of pessimistic approach to the opposite that Iran wouldn't have in uh, Turkey. Uh, what, how would you interpret the, the killing of Suleimani? Because they have been given that the, the title of the future of Syria by, by, by Assad. So having said that, would it, would it by time, yeah. But by, by the uh, opposition. Yeah, opposition, sorry. So, so don't you think it would be kind of a, an opportunity or a kind of a, a good thing for, for Turkey from a realist perspective, like having killed someone because Turkey, Turkish foreign policy is against what, what they did, the, the regime in Syria, right, the Assad. So don't you think it would be, it would be serving the, the Turkish interest in the country, in, the, in, the, in the Syria? And for Professor Sami, uh, so there is, in, in, in one of the news media, common news media called Kaihan News in Iran, uh, they, they quoted from a professor at the University, from the University of Lebanon, he said that assassination of Suleimani marks the beginning of uh, the end of Israel and the U.S. hegemony. So how, how would, you, would, you, would you comment or you would anything on that? Plus, you said like uh, having the Ummah, like, without any division of Shia or Sunni. But unfortunately, we have seen, like even for killing of Suleimani, calling him a martyr up in a, a dilemma, kind of a problematic approach between the, the sect of Shia and, and especially for Sunnis. The majority of the, these scholars have been against even calling him a martyr. Thank you very much. We'll hear responses from our speakers, and then if you have extra questions, we'll take them up. Okay. <coughs> the question about the 
we cannot, it is not ethical, of course, to talk about, uh, about benefits or the opportunities or uh, after such an assassination against Qasem Suleiman. And he was, of course, responsible of, of all Iranians' policies in the, in the region in general. So, but not himself only. It was the uh, United States also is responsible of many, 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 many massacres and many killings of millions of people in Middle East. Uh, we, we wish United States will be out, completely out of out of this region, of course. And if not United States, Iran could not have that opportunity or that uh, that that the space to, to to behave in this way or to move in in in, in, in this easiness in the, in the in the region. Or, or if we, we we are to seek for. The real, genuine responsible of all these crimes is United States, from our point of view. Uh, so they killed, of course, uh, one guy and uh, Qasem Soleimani. And Qasem Soleimani, uh, we cannot make, we, we can not make an, a witness or a positive witness about him. In, 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 in the funeral, if somebody asked how 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 do you know him, unfortunately we didn't know him as a as a good guy, but. It doesn't mean that we wish to, to be killed in this way, especially by the United States. And the United States didn't kill him because of his crimes, or because of his roles in these massacres. Just on the contrary, what what the United States was uh, was urging for was his role. They allowed him to play this role for 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 the gates in this region. And now they killed him because I think they tried to change the game. There is another game now. I mean, you should understand understand the elements of this game, and this game is never it will, will never be on the benefit of for the benefit of for, uh, of, of the ummah for the benefit of the Muslim and Shia united or Sunni and uh, Shia unity, for example. Just on the contrary, it is, it is to to, to, to in, install another another uh, fitna uh, before, uh, between the two parts, and uh, actually. The existence of United States in in, in Middle East is somebody's they, uh, their role is ending because they changed the, they they shifted their policies from Middle East to the to China for instance. But I I understand uh, or uh, they, 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 now they before they, they they need they were in need of oil in the of the Middle East, but now they don't have. This. I think. The uh, United States have never, I mean, needed the oil. They needed to control the supply of the uh, of the oil, and the supply, the controlling the supply, the supply of the oil is much, much more important than owning it. And United States is is, is self-sufficient in terms of oil now. It's, you know, you know, there are many, many sources of uh, of oil they they, they 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 own. And but you know, Timothy Mitchell, I don't know whether you know, the, he has a very good. Two, two very good bo books on the, the carbon, uh, I think, and on carbon uh, resources or something that the carbon wars probably, and also on, on the colonization of Egypt. And Timothy Mitchell, he said that the, the, the interest of United States in oil, in the oil of the Middle East, is not something to catch, to come and to exploit it and to to to. to, to to take it to, 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 to its country. Just on the contrary, it's, it is to control the supply. In order to, to control, <coughs> control the technology is based on oil, on oil technology, or, and also to control the prices of the oil. Just, just this, I mean, if you understand this, to control the, the prices of, the, of, of oil uh, is also the, the front in its war against China in the, in the, in the War in the in the future against China, and, and the front of uh, war against China is beginning in is starting in, uh, in, in 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 the Middle East. So because you know these golfs, uh, the, the Gulf is flying uh, China's uh, oil for about seventy. I, I, I don't know more than fifty percent of, of of the oil of China is coming from here. And so controlling is strategically is very important from the United States point of view. One. In, one reason for the United States' interest in the Middle East is this, and the second one, more important than, of course, is to control the Middle East not to be united. They don't want, for example, sometimes naively and from international point of view, how United States is trying to to, to set a stable and control uh, and governable Middle East. They have nothing to do with such an ideals. They they love Middle East to be unstable 
uh, in, in a creative, in always permanent creative chaos, to be in chaos and permanently in chaos. They don't have a vision of Middle East to be in peace, united, like United, uh, like European Union, for example. That was the idea of Turkey, for example. That was the it is the idea of Muslims to be in keep in peace, united with the Shia, the Muslim, the, the, the Sunnah and the Arabs, Turks, Kurds, everybody will be will, will work in, in peace uh, all together. Be, and this will be a threat to Israel. And, but, yeah, but of course, we come to the third one, third, third uh, very important I mean, priority of the United States is the security of Israel. And Israel is the key point, the key reason for the United States. And for keeping Israel in this safe point, every, all countries around should be weakened, weakened, uh, destabilized, destabilized, and for destabilizing this, uh, the Shia-Sunni conflict should be always uh, permanent, and unfortunately, Iran is serving this idea. They are, they are, they are trying, and they, they don't, for example, refrain from making, uh, for, from making a, a solidarity, Shia-Sunni, solidarity, unity, just like he was, it was stated by by Imam Khomeini, for example, he was saying that we are all Muslims, not, 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 I mean, it's not important to be Shia, Sunni. He, he made a very good criticism on Shia, uh, uh, the historical Shia. But uh, now we see in the policies of Iran, just on the contrary, they are trying to make a sectarian policies, and they are proud of, for example, prevailing the Sunni centers, for example. What, why you are proud of this? Why you are saying, for example, when Tayyip Erdogan you ask about Turkish role in, Sun, in sectarian issue, and we are proud of saying that our, our leader, Turkish leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, in his visit, in his visit to Najaf, he very openly, very, very understandably said that we are not Sunni, we are Muslims. In Najaf, in his visit, and he visited Najaf and he said, we are not Sunni, we are Muslims. And we expect from the Iranians also to say this, of course. We hope, of course. Yeah. We, make, we will make all pressure over the, on, on them. And then we, we, we didn't uh, kiss or, kiss or, or hope from uh, such things to happen, of course. It is our vision and our, our idea at the end. I mean, sooner or later, that should happen. That, should happen. that has to uh, happen in order to make, to, to build a new world. That is our claim or our, our vision of the future civilization of the world, uh, inshallah, that, that will, will, will happen. And Turkish uh, stand in this way, especially our parties of Taipei one's vision, and all the Muslim intellectuals in general, Islam, Islamist in general, intellectuals in Turkey in general are in this uh, stand. And we are not, of course, seizing our hopes from Iran. We still try to, all criticism, all criticism against Iran is in uh, something rather than criticism, friendly criticism, not to say, for example, I mean, to be hostile criticisms against them. Thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> let me address these questions very quickly, several of them. First, in the Sunni Shia divide. In February 2017, a person who's very um, strategic mind by the name of George Friedman, for those who know him, wrote an article. It was about a few weeks after uh, Trump took office. And he was basically, it's a long article, but the gist of it is that uh, the US had different options in the Middle East after 9-11. Uh, they pursued, Bush pursued one, it failed <coughs> to invade them, you know, uh, try to, to uh, bring these regimes down, or uh, try to move away, which he thought this was Obama policy to withdraw, which is, it can't happen. Then his recommendation was that we need to uh, look at our history, meaning American history, and with that, <coughs> we look at our enemies and we see their, their weakest point and we exploit and divide them into two camps. And he said, if we look at the Muslim world, what is the biggest divide? It's the Sunni Shia divide. That's what we need to do. That is the strategy we need to pursue. We need to look at the Sunni world, the Shia world, and, and try to, to, to drive a wedge where they can be hitting each other, weakening each other, defeating each other. That would be the best way to pursue it. So I, and there's no doubt in my mind that this has been a US policy, not because Friedman wrote it, even before that, but I think he basically was trying to crystallize it, uh, crystallize it in geopolitical terms. In terms of calling Sulaimani Shaheed or not calling Shaheed, it depends where you're coming from. For those who looked at Sulaimani, because he, you know, I think people were criticizing the head of Hamas when he called him the martyr of Jerusalem. From his standpoint, 
uh, no one did for Jerusalem uh, in the world like he did. He basically was, was funding millions of dollars to watch that uh, confrontation with Israel, or training, uh, technology, arms, uh, you name it. So from his standpoint, that's how he looked at Suleiman. For those who looked at Suleimani as being the person who stopped the advance of certain uh, uh, groups or militias or what have you, obviously uh, they would not agree with that. So again, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to tell you where I stand on that, but I can tell you exactly what each camp was, was referring to. Uh, he was looked at as a hero by some, and he was looked, looked at as, as a villain uh, by others. A U.S. threat to the Middle East, <clears throat> well, again, depends where you're coming from. You are in the camps of the monarchies or those who are friends or Israel for that matter, US is your biggest ally. If you are taking a position against these, especially the counter revolutionary forces which are aligning themselves with US and US policy, obviously it is a threat. And obviously from the standpoint of Iran, it doesn't see a bigger threat than than the US. So again, it depends where you're coming from. There is a this is not it's not mathematics. This is not one plus one equals two. These are actually very hard-headed headed, uh, assessments and evaluations that depends on your perspective and where you stand on these issues. And that's, you may find people from the same region, from the same country, even from the same uh, 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 political party, that they may, may differ on, on how they assess this. But uh, uh, if you want to take a position of being a person or a group who values certain, who has certain values they're trying to protect, then the answer to, to that question should not be very difficult. The role of the international community, there is nothing called international community. These rules are only for the little countries, for the parts. The U.S. does not hold itself to a standard which say this, or this is international law, and the U.S. is violating international law. The U.S. does not recognize these things at all. It sets up the rules, but for others to follow. So the U.S. sets up the rule for the International Criminal Court, but it is not a party to it, because it does not be held responsible. No, no one, if I, am, if, I am, if I am in charge of the world, no one can come and hold me accountable. All right, if the President of the United States does something, at best, maybe Congress will hold him accountable. Even that, nowadays, is very difficult. But no one can hold it. So when we talk about international law, international law is good that you can use just to make your point. But if you want, if you think that you're going to get your rights back, or you somehow you're going <coughs> to get uh, uh, a position or something out of the international law, uh, good luck. Because in most instances now in today's world, this is this is not how things things happen. When you have equal powers then you can probably talk about setting certain rules by which they can adjudicate their differences, like what happened with Dayton, Dayton between the Soviet Union and the U.S. at one point. So I don't want to discount international law. It's very important, but I don't also want to use it as the lever by which you can get back your rights, because that's not going to happen. So basically, that's why, which Iran, by the way, concluded that a long time ago. When it was invaded in 1980, actually the Security Council did say that Iraq was, you know, they didn't say exactly that, but, they, but that they should stop and, and go back to the, to the borders, but they never actually helped Iran in getting back its territory. It was Iran, through very hard sacrifices, that went back and repelled the, the invasion of, of, of Iraq. Similarly, when Kuwait was invaded by Iraq, there were all kinds of resolutions that Iraq didn't care about. It was American, uh, uh, actually, military uh, invasion and military victory that repelled it back. So, and Israel, look at Israel. How many resolutions? How many? Dozens and dozens of resolutions against Israel. It never respected a single one of them. And who, who's enabling it to do it? The United States, even with, with Trump, even going the farthest with, with Jerusalem and Golan Heights and so on and so forth. Is Iran healthy for the... Uh, for, for the region, again, depends where you're coming from. See, all these things are, you know, both sides. For those who are anti-Iran, of course, Iran is the menace. Iran is the biggest threat. Even some of them see it as bigger threat than Israel. And for those who are pro-Iran or pro-Palestine, and they think that Iran is helping them in confronting Zionism, of course, Iran is very healthy. 
and is needed because it, it checks out those powers which are trying either to put out the resistance or try to, to, to pressure them. So again, it depends where it comes from. And I, I can assure you that there, there will be both, uh, both sides, especially. But a lot of people are, are confused or, or they have the two agendas. Finally, are all these bases, actually, two more, are all these bases against Iran? The uh, U.S. has different interests. So uh, certainly, they, they, you know, and, and they can uh, basically deal with, two in with, with these interests all uh, simultaneously. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But certainly, as the U.S. sees it, uh, for many years now, that the biggest threat, and they have said it in all their national security assessments and national <coughs> security uh, plans, always they talk about North Korea, Iran, Russia, and, and China. This is stable since George W. Bush and Obama and Trump. Whenever they talk about what are the strategic threats, they talk about North Korea, they talk about Iran as being in regional threats, and globally they talk about the competition now, the new, the new world, with Russia and China. So Iran has always been stable. And you could see also from the funding, you can from from the from the uh, budgets, you know how big of a, a threat is Iran, and you can tell when you look at the military budget and and the assessment and the deployments. These deployments cost billions and billions of dollars. When they have all these ships in the Strait of Hormuz, you know, uh, just to show you very quickly, I think I may have it, maybe not, um, in terms of the shipping and U.S. Presence. I don't have too much time. If I find it quickly, I will do it. Otherwise, I can do that later. Oh, here it is. <coughs> Look at the shipping. The Strait of Hormuz takes 40%. So there's a lot of interest there in oil also, which Iran can directly threaten. Iran has the biggest coastline along the Persian Gulf, along the Gulf. And the Strait of Hormuz, it, it can hit any ship at once. So they have to, I mean, obviously there's other interests. Finally, about uh, someone saying that this is the end of Israel, of course there's a lot of rhetoric and that's going to come out. But certainly, if the U.S., as the Arab Hezbollah said a few days ago in Hassan Nasrallah, if the U.S. is driven out of the Middle East, if that actually happens, that will, that will tremendously uh, uh, weaken the state of Israel and its ability to confront all the different threats that it has. Thank you very much, Dr. Sami. Uh, we may have Time for one more question. Okay. Okay, we'll have the last two questions, Dr. Ivan, then the brother of the And now, Stan, we know that it's a nuclear power. How come that the USA is not showing any security? Uh, and the uh, question from the gentleman. And we saw that in before, that before in Pakistan and Afghanistan, when the America uh, went to the Taliban to destroy it, they used the Pakistan bases. Because of that, the Afghanistan and the Taliban become the biggest enemy to the Pakistan. But now, as we saw that the, the, the party, the political exchanges and the new leader came over here, and in last one and a half years, we saw that they solved out the problems with the Pakistan and Afghanistan by sitting on the table. And now the US also needs them. The same why, why not in the last, uh, which we saw in the 1400 years in uh, history, we saw that always has a fight between the Middle East. It is a history of that. So why not the people, uh, the uh, powers changes that people, but in the 21st centuries, why not the two uh, Middle East powers sit together on the table and they solve the issues and, and the things we can be <coughs> solved on that way. Okay. Which Eastern <coughs> power are you referring to? I'm talking, of course, the one of the biggest Shia powers, the Irani, and the biggest power in the Islamic world, you can say, uh, Saudi Arabia, we use the uh, Middle East in the Sunni region. Okay, we have our last remarks from our two speakers. Let's do two or three minutes. <coughs> if you are, you are asking about uh, Turkish permission to for the United States to use its uh, bases against any Muslim country. Turkey always had uh, many reservations against this. The United States is not with full authority to use these bases against any country. Of course, of course, they, and, and, and they did, and several, it, 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 many times. It's similar for in Qatar, Qatar also there is the US uh, power, they have this base, and they also stop 
for, for using the Tibetan No, from Qatar, it, it, for, Qatar has its own authority, its own sovereignty. I don't know whether the, the, their agreement is allowing this. Uh, I mean, in this. theory they do, but they never will, because here you have Holland. Over there it's just a... Yes, in Turkey we have Holland. I think using, using the base doesn't need the, mm -hmm. the, the permission of the parliament. Using the base to invade someone else. Not to, ah yes, to invade needs, but to, to use by yes. air strikes, yes. I think they, they don't need that. I think they don't need I think they don't need I'm not sure about this. No, because if, uh, I think, no, no, I'm sure about this. Because they need to get permission if they're yeah. going to attack. Yeah, and, and, and be sure, and com and, uh, definitely, if, the, if a parliamentary and, and permission is needed, it is impossible. It's impossible from Turkey uh, for any... Uh, United States I mean, uh, operation against any Muslim country to be permitted by Turkish parliament. First, the Muslim and the uh, party, uh, I mean, the deputies will resist, will refuse. And also, the, there is a, almost an agreement, a consensus in parliament in, in such issues. Probably uh, the, the, the HDP may agree because they are always with the, 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 the name, now they became the uh, what is it? spontaneous uh, uh, ally of the United States. But what about the two powers? The, the problem is all about the two biggest countries that we saw in the Polish coalition and the Middle East and the Saudi Arabia. They always have the fight. Either they are backing in some government or they are backing Okay, uh, you asked, three points were raised. One is about Pakistan being a nuclear power, and why it hasn't. Actually, Pakistan became nuclear power, but declared in 1998, I believe, or 1990. Uh, it was for a long time, since 93, it was resisted, and the US actually had sanctions on both India and Pakistan. India first detonated a nuclear bomb, and a week later, Pakistan did. Because obviously, these two powers are facing each other. Pakistan has not said ever that it is developing uh, nuclear power to uh, basically deter Israel or at least to counterbalance Israel. That was never the case. So I think secretly speaking, the U.S. has acquiesced to the fact that Pakistan must have nuclear power because it's facing India. But I think at the same time they have put restrictions on Pakistan. I think they accepted that this will never be allowed to give any kind of transfer of technology to any uh, confrontational state with Israel, and that this would be only kept uh, as deterrence uh, towards India. So I think that was the end. But even that, in 1984, when it came to be known that Pakistan was developing this technology, Israel more than one time, they wanted to hit that reaction, but because of logistical and distance, they couldn't do it. And remember, this was in the midst of the Soviet uh, presence in Afghanistan, where the US needed Pakistan during Reagan in order to, to confront the service in Afghanistan. So they used, even did not give any permission for Israel to do that, even the, because that meant that they have to use American technology and planes, and planes so that they can be uh, uh, fueled in the air and so on. So it was very risky, but at the same time, it was uh, the U.S. who didn't go for it. Now, in terms of Taliban and U.S. and Taliban, I mean, I mean certainly U.S. is very pragmatic, um, the international power, and they will uh, basically uh, negotiate with anybody if they need to, but they put restrictions. You know, part of the agreement that is probably going to be concluded this year between the US and Taliban is that Taliban will never ever house either type uh, groups or help them or support them or associate with them. Now imagine if the US, and they have been requesting that from Iran, for us to work together or to at least uh, to, to conclude any agreement, you need to stop completely any help to any group that is fighting Israel. Would Iran accept that? I doubt very much that would be the case. So it's, I mean, yes, I mean, it, that's what Trump has been saying for, for years, you know, for at least two years, that you know, I would like to conclude an agreement with Iran, and they put several conditions. One of these conditions is that they should totally support any hostile uh, uh, powers towards Israel. Finally, about negotiating Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, here we're really talking about apples and oranges. Uh, I think, but it's it, it, uh, interesting enough though, uh, what the Prime Minister of Iraq said in his speech to Parliament a couple of days ago after the assassination of Soleimani, is that in that morning, he was killed in the evening, that morning at 8.30, he was going to uh, meet with Soleimani because Iraq was 
uh, uh, mediator between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that the Saudis have given the Iranians a proposal about something. And I think it had to do probably with, with attacks, oil, whatever it is. And the one who was in charge of this to get the response back was Soleimani himself. So for he was visiting Iran, and the Americans knew that, by the way. And even they knew that they still assassinated him. He was going to meet with him at 8.30 to give him his response, what well, Iran's response, that is, to Saudi Arabia about having some kind of a, either truce or, or something, perhaps in Yemen, perhaps in, in the oil. No one really knows the details. But that, that was going on. It wasn't, it's not direct. But there are so many things that divide him. It would be very difficult to see uh, any kind of reconciliation. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the interest of the states will over Trump any ideological differences. So it might happen, but I, I don't see it right now, because I think Saudi Arabia is trying to see, as well as Israel and other, uh, an actual confrontation, hostility between the US and Iran, because they think this is their chance with Trump. This is, even though Trump has pledged that he will never have another Middle East war, but they think this is their, their chance to hit Iran where it counts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our speakers. Before we conclude, I would like to ask Dr. Sami to present this momento to yes. Professor Atta. Thank you very much for your attendance, Yani. Follow, uh, follow us with uh, our upcoming activities. We occasionally have those seminars. Uh, if you haven't uh, signed your your name, leave us leave us with your email, and we'll update you with with all of our activities. Thank you very much. Everything is.